learn to communicate in ways that people can understand because we've got to communicate with each other. And one of the ways we've got to do that is for all citizens to really listen to others and don't just get in your neighborhood and your circle and let the world close in on you. Broaden your horizon. Listen to people, disagree with them. That's part of democracy, but do it in a civil way. Civility and respect, enormously important. Listening, very important. Welcome to Straight Talk, a podcast about big ideas featuring candid discussions with some of the world's foremost thinkers and doers. I'm Hank Paulson, chairman of the Paulson Institute, and today I'm speaking with Sam Nunn. Sam is a co-founder and co-chair of the Nuclear Threat Initiative, NTI, a global security organization focused on reducing nuclear and biological threats imperiling humanity. He served as chief executive officer of NTI for 16 years until June of 2017 and continues as strategic advisor. Sam served as a U.S. Senator from Georgia for 24 years, from 1972 to 1996. During his tenure in the U.S. Senate, he served as chairman of the Senate Armed Services Committee. In addition to his work with NTI, Sam has continued his service in the public policy arena as a distinguished professor in the Sam Nunn School of International Affairs at Georgia Tech and as chairman emeritus of the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington, D.C. Sam, welcome to the podcast. You've had an extraordinary career as a giant of the Senate, a legendary chairman of the Armed Services Committee during the Cold War, and you've continued to make a big difference in the national security space ever since. I'm really looking forward to our discussion today. And so let's start right in. During your time in the Senate, you were known not just as an authority in national security, but as a real moral authority. Where did that come from? Talk about your upbringing in Georgia. What did you learn from your parents? Why law school? Well, of course, uh, the moral authority, um, it it only comes with time. And I very much appreciate you saying that because uh, that is one of the ingredients that I think is most important in public service. My father was a small town lawyer. He was mayor the first six years of my life. Of course, I did not know that at the time but I came from a very small town, Perry, Georgia, about 3,000 people when I was growing up. Uh, We always had honest government. I don't ever remember a scandal. Uh, We had a church type community. The uh, churches were a a big influence. And the old saying, it takes a village to to raise a child. The village sort of raised all of us back then. Uh, We, were exposed to people like my basketball coach, uh, who was also the Sunday school teacher. And he also was a straw boss for the peach packing shed in the summer, a whole busload of students, 15, 16, 17, 18 years old. And we worked in peaches, so to speak. So from my father, my mother, um, my church um, experiences, my basketball coach, basketball was the only game in town then. We didn't have football when I was growing up. All of those things played a huge influence, but there's an old saying, I'd rather see a sermon than hear one any day. And I think um, I saw a a lot of sermons. I had a lot of heroes growing up. Many of them I didn't know, but I read a lot. And the the heroes I had, uh, most of them were pretty good role models. And so all of that kind of combined. But when we talk about moral authority, in the uh, context of the United States Senate. Uh, That um, includes not simply uh, no corruption, it includes the necessity of intellectual honesty, and that is the hardest ingredient in the political world. Let's go back to your beginning in in the political world. You you first entered politics as a member of the Georgia House of Representatives in 1968. What inspired you to get into politics, and what was your first political campaign like? Well, the first campaign and the second campaign were both two-year terms in the Georgia House of Representatives. I was very, very lucky. I did not have opposition in those first two races. And so my first real race was running for the United States Senate. That was my first uh, real political campaign. But I was inspired to get into politics, I think, because of my father 
and he was in the Georgia House of Representatives and the State Board of Education before I was born. Uh, but I was also inspired by my great uncle, my grandmother's brother, Carl Vinson, who served in the House of Representatives in Washington for 50 years. At the time he retired, he had the record. Uh, so all of those things entered into it, but I was interested in government. I was interested in foreign policy. And one of my first experiences uh, out of uh, law school was working for the House Armed Services Committee. And I was a, a staff counsel working for a very experienced guy that was a general counsel, one of the general counsels. And he came in one day, Hank, and asked me, I said he had a death in the family. He was supposed to go on a trip to NATO. And the NATO trip was sponsored by the U.S. Air Force, three weeks touring military bases. That he couldn't go. I'm 23 years old. I just got my top secret clearance. And these were all staff, key staff people in the House and Senate uh, that uh, were much older than me. But lo and behold, he asked me to go in his place. I did. Three days later, I was in Europe. And uh, about four days later, the Cuban Missile Crisis broke out. So that was, of course, before I got into politics. And that experience had a rather profound effect on me in terms of a vision and determination to get into politics, to get into public office. At that time, I thought about the House, not the Senate, and to try to work on what I consider to be um, vital security interests that really indeed uh, pose threats to the world. So that was a, a pretty uh, sobering and enlightening experience going through that and being briefed every day by the U.S. Air Force and getting a classified kind of up close look at the dangers of the Cuban Missile Crisis and how close we came. Yeah, and, and then running for office, it's a lot different though than, than, uh, than reading intelligence reports and and knowing how important national security is. So you've got to, to sell yourself to the voters. Well, that's right. That's right. Seeing it up close and is a lot different than reading about it. And of course, when I, when I went to Washington, I was working for one of the most powerful people there. He happened to be my great uncle. It was uh, pretty enlightening to see the tremendous responsibilities of the Congress under the Constitution in terms of our national security. People think of national security as being primarily the president. Of course, the president plays a huge role as commander in chief, but Congress is responsible for raising armies under the Constitution. Congress is responsible for declaring war, uh, though it's gotten out of the habit of uh, exercising that responsibility very carefully, uh, or at least very often. And so uh, it was pretty much instilled in me that Congress had a huge role in all of this also, not just the president. And then, obviously, you ran for and became a senator. And that's where, you know, you are, your career is best known to, to so many of us. And as the chairman of the powerful U.S. Senate Armed Services Committee, you had a major impact on defense issues during the Cold War. I want to talk about some of those issues in a moment. But first, can you help our listeners understand the important role of the Senate Committee on Armed Services? Well, the Armed Services Committee really is the authorizing committee, and there's a dual process for the money to actually get appropriated, and it, so it takes an authorization and an appropriation. But the Armed Services Committee recommends, and the Senate and the House have to approve the size of the military forces, the budget of the military forces, the procurement uh, system of, of ships and planes and tanks and so forth, and also the uh, personnel rules uh, in terms of the overall relationship between the military service and the civilian service, all of those personnel issues um, under the Armed Services Committee. And we also, at the time I was on the committee, we also were the Basic Intelligence Committee. Uh, that was a pretty uh, interesting uh, break-in in the Senate, but that changed later, and they Senate created and the House created their own intelligence committee, so that separated later. But all of that meant that basically Armed Services Committee was exposed to everything in foreign affairs that related to national security. Yep. So now let's talk about a huge geopolitical national security issue of today, the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Talk about the potential, for, first of all, you know, this is just a massive 
humanitarian horror right now and, and in, impacting a lot of people in very, very negative ways in Ukraine. But it's going to have, you know, huge geopolitical implications. You know, it's, it's got immediate implications and it's going to have very long standing implications. But I'd like you to talk about how you see this playing out, the potential off ramps you see, and the framework you would suggest for resolving this dangerous situation. But first, give our listeners some context. What do you think are the root causes of this crisis, and, and then how do you see it playing out? Well, I think this um, invasion by Russia and really by Putin, I think an awful lot of the, even the soldiers participating don't really know why they're there and what the cause is. And of course, the invasion, in my view, and I think the view of the world, was illegal, and I think it was immoral. And I also believe that uh, if Barbara Tuckman were here rewriting it, any chapters in her book called The March of Folly, which is the history of blunders leading into uh, catastrophic wars, uh, this would be a new chapter and Putin would be leading the March of Folly. He's made some, I think, very terrible judgments and some uh, serious strategic mistakes, misjudging the courage, the fortitude of the Ukrainian people. But when you look at, the, let's say, the, from the perspective of Russia, what they were trying to accomplish, what, what has happened, the first thing is they've united Ukraine. The second thing is they wanted to disarm Ukraine. Ukraine is going to be much more heavily armed, even if they take, if the Russians take the cities. Ukrainian people are going to still fight, and they're going to have stinger missiles, they're going to have anti-tank weapons, they're going to have a lot more arms than they did. The third thing is that, that Putin has united NATO. Several American presidents have tried to get NATO to increase their uh, defense spending. I tried to do that way back in the 70s and 80s to some ex with, with some success, but limited. And so NATO is really stepping up to the plate here with uh, economic sanctions and with increased pledges of uh, defense uh, strengthening. Putin, uh, probably the last thing he wanted to do was awaken and arouse Germany. And he's done that big time in terms of both their economic decision to counsel the pipeline, as well as um, their furnishing of arms. So uh, in my view, all of those things are exactly the opposite of what Putin intended. In addition to that, his, his friends, uh, the Chinese, have got to be scratching their head about what kind of partners they, they have. And I think that will have long term, probably not immediate implications, but I think it will. So Putin, uh, in my view, would be wise to basically have a ceasefire, stop the firing, and basically withdraw the troops. We know he isn't going to do that immediately, but uh, that's his best uh, exit strategy. Any other exit strategy depends on stopping the killing of innocent people in Ukraine. From that point, when he does that, we could talk about a number of things. But Hank, I want to make one point. The Ukrainian president is, is now looked on with admiration, not only by his own people, but all over the world. And his military leaders are certainly a lot of heroes out there, a lot of heroes in the civilian population. I think any agreement, any kind of uh, negotiation, and there's got to be a negotiation in terms of the future beyond the ceasefire, I think the Ukrainian the leadership of the Ukrainian people are going to need to take the lead in that. The U.S. will be there. NATO will be there. We'll be involved. But they have uh, certainly shown that they they should be the ones to decide uh, the crucial questions. And there are crucial questions about their future. And whatever they decide is going to have huge geopolitical ramifications. And so you you were sitting in that very pivotal uh position in the Senate during the Cold War. What do you see as the major lessons of the Cold War? And I, I want to talk about it in terms of China, because China is a strategic competitor, it's clear they are, but they're a, a much more formidable competitor than the Soviet Union ever was, because they, they are a big nation with a very large economy interconnected all over the world. So that makes that strategic uh, you know, U.S.-China strategic competition very different. And you, know, you could look at what's going on now and say it's going to be hugely, hugely important to the, all of Europe. But I could argue that what this does 
uh, or doesn't do to the U.S.-China competition could have even more significant ramifications in the future. So, Sam, what would you offer on that? What strategies should the United States pursue to deal with the China challenge in the midst of all this war and, and horror in, in Ukraine? Well, I, I, I like your choice of the word competitor, and sometimes uh, adversary is the uh, got to be the word with economic models as well as also models yep. like South China Sea and so forth. But I, I like to avoid the word enemy unless you're really fighting because I think that can become self-fulfilling. And we have a lot of mutual interest with China, a lot of economic interest, interest on the glo- global climate, which will affect us all, interest in preventing certainly any kind of nuclear war, interest in um, Uh, being able to fight contagious disease and certainly pandemics like we've had with COVID, all of those are mutual interests. And both of our nations have, uh, I think, a mutual stake. And so identifying common interests and a mutual stake is, to me, pretty fundamental, whether it's the Soviet Union during the Cold War on arms control or whether it's China in any number of veins now. But I think with China, we have to be... um, we have to think long range. We have to think strategically. We have to, in my view, be, be firm with them, but they have to participate in the overall rule making. They are a huge part of the world. The international rules affect them. I think we need, we, the world needs to listen to the, their views on uh, the shape of the world as they see it as we go down the road, but we have to hold them accountable. They have to be held accountable. They can have a huge positive effect in the world, uh, but they can also have a huge negative effect. And so the rules of the road are important. They need to participate in them and they need to be held accountable. I think one of the fundamental lessons of the Cold War is uh, allies. You need allies. And fortunately, we had allies, stalwart allies in uh, the Cold War vis-a-vis the Soviet Union. And we have allies in Asia today, uh, very strong allies, including Japan, including um, I use that term briefly, but let's call it friends, uh, which is broader term than allies, and that would include India, and certainly Australia is an ally, and New Zealand, and a lot of Southeast Asian nations. So uh, we have friends in that part of the world. They they want us to get along with China. They do not want to have uh, the U.S. on one side and China on the other, and they have to pick and choose every week or month. So all of those things uh, are important, but I would say fundamentally is continue to have an intensive dialogue. In fact, I would step up the dialogue and I would let that dialogue spread to various levels. I like to see military to military meetings. I like to see scientific to scientific kind of peer groups meeting. Uh, I like to see the medical community um, and both countries have a lot of dialogue about how we can work together to deal with things like COVID and other infectious diseases, which are inevitable in the future. So that's a very broad picture, Hank, but you know more about China than almost anyone. And uh, how would you assess um, the the top one or two priorities in China? I'd love to get your view. When I look at the strategic competition, it it needs to begin with being strong at home, right? I expect strength. And so being strong, you know, fixing issues around our democracy and the way it's working in our our economy. It means being strong abroad, you know, and militarily, economically, diplomatically. And you made a comment about allies and how critically important they are. And I agree with you just totally. But this is very important in terms of of strengthening NATO, in terms of uh, sanctions and, and defensive moves. But you know, we have been losing ground to China offensively in terms of economic leadership. We can't just be looking at trade remedies as a way to close markets, right? We need to be a leader. We have to lead in setting economic standards around the world. And we can't let China trade with 90 more nations do more trade than we do. A really proactive approach there. I would say that in addition to be, being strong economically and militarily, I think to look at what's going on in China right now, they can't be loving this, right? That this is, you know, the party Congress meets this year and everyone's been focused on Xi Jinping's election, which would be for, you know, for another term. 
but it's much broader than that. There's all sorts of well over 100 senior party leaders that are going to be retiring and a new generation coming in. And so this is an election year and their election goes on under the surface. We see all our turmoil above the surface, but theirs is going on under. And they've clearly wanted to paint a, a beautiful picture a strong economy and stability. And this clearly doesn't help them. There's going to be energy price problems. There's going to be food prices are going to go up. And then they've also got this added question. They've always made a big point about respecting national uh, sovereignty, right? And Ukraine is one of their largest trading partners. So now they're trying to walk this line between national sovereignty and historical legacy, right? And, and make, that, make that argument. And that's going to be a very, very difficult thing for them to do. So my view is that it's too early to tell how this is going to play out, right? A lot of this is going to be determined by how China behaves. That, and, and we need to be prepared for everything. We need, and we need to be strong because whatever we do, being strong and having that dialogue, talking to them, working with them to try to resolve this crisis the things that you suggested, I think, are key. And I'm hoping that this evolves in a way that this just doesn't, we don't see a 50-year detente between the U.S. and China ending, right? The two big superpowers, that would be a disaster for both countries in the world. So I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, uh, that there's going to be ways, whether they're an adversary or a strategic partner, that we that we work together when it's in both of our mutual interests. And if we don't, the world's going to be a really dangerous and difficult place to live in because the problems you cited, and we're going to be talking about uh, denuclearization in a while and some of these other things, but the big problems like climate change and, you know, and, and peace and, and so on are difficult enough to come to conclusions on or to address just with our allies let alone to have to work with someone who's a strategic competitor. So again, I agree with just about everything you said there. One other thought on China is they could play a huge role right now in a quiet way with Russia by picking up uh, whatever their communication is and saying it's time to call off the killing and start talking seriously about how you build stability. And also, I, I think one of the, I agree with everything you said, I think Getting our own house in order is fundamental in dealing with China, both in terms of our political system and in terms of our uh, military and technological strength. Uh, but one of the things that I think we could actually help build bridges on or would help build bridges with China is what well, I know you've talked about a good bit, and that is the rule of law. Uh, it's in fundamentally in their interest to develop a system of rule of law where investors and people who own private property have confidence uh, that their judicial system is going to work correctly. I think they've got a way to go on that. And I know when I first met Deng Xiaoping, that was in 1975, before he actually became the official leader of China, he made it very clear that people's property was enormously important. He made it clear that property was uh, the key to incentives, and incentives were the key to building a different kind of economy in China. And that was in the first conversation with him. And so I think that uh, would, uh, would go a long way with China. The only other thing I would say on China is Chairman Mao, and I don't normally co quote him because uh, his history is, is certainly uh, pretty brutal, but he used to say back when he was talking about the United States, but mainly he was talking about the Soviet Union, uh, do not seek hegemony, meaning do not try to dominate others. And I think looking back at the quote from Mao, Chairman Mao, about do not see hegemony plays got to play in China now because the Southeast Asian nations and a number of their neighbors are very concerned that China may be heading in that direction. And so I hope they look back at their own history, both in terms of Deng Xiaoping and property rights, and also Chairman Mao on the limited advice he gave, a lot of other I wouldn't take, about do not seek hegemony in Europe, part of the world. Say amen on the uh, point you made about the role that China could play in helping to end this Russian aggression. You know, I think many people 
looked at the China-Russia relationship and thought that it was uh, tactically significant to, to, to China because they were concerned about Western or U.S. hegemony. I don't think people looked at, they thought of, of Russia as being a China uh, proxy, not China as being a Ru- Russian proxy. And now it looks like their ally is threatening to drive them in a direction that could be very negative for them and, and uh, certainly for the world. So, uh, you know, ho- hopefully they play that role. I want to move on to the area you're best known for, Sam. You founded and co-chair the Nuclear Threat Initiative. Up until recently, nuclear risk was something most Americans stopped thinking about, okay? It was a relic of the Cold War. People would read about the Cuban Missile Crisis. But for many years, you've argued the risk that a leader will make a terrible decision to use nuclear weapons or that a terrorist could get one is growing. Now, uh, discuss the nature of today's nuclear threats and what can be done to defuse the risks that you've warned about. And of course, you always, when you talked about it, you talked about all, you know, the nuclear arsenal, you know, and the weapons that still existed, you know, in the Soviet Union and within the former Soviet Union countries. So talk a bit about that. Well, one of our continuing challenges is to protect nuclear materials, Hank, because Catastrophic terrorism is uh, something we at the Nuclear Threat Initiative, Ernie Moniz and I and Joan Rolfing and our experts staff, we, we worry a lot about that. Um, and we've spent a lot of our time over the last 20 years making sure that countries do everything they can to secure their weapons usable nuclear material and where possible blend it down so it cannot be used in a bomb because the technological knowledge is out there of how to make a crude weapon. Keeping that out of the hands of terrorists is a huge deal. The second point I would make is preventing escalation in a war, particularly like going on right now in uh, Ukraine, making sure that leaders do not turn to nuclear weapons, taking nuclear weapons off the table. I think Putin was reckless when he put his nuclear forces on alert, and I thought President Biden handled it well by not putting ours on alert until, of course, we watch what happens on the ground. Then I thought President Biden also did a good job in postponing the missile test, just so we don't take any chance on false warning. And going to false warning, one of my biggest worries on the nuclear side now, beyond escalation, the latter from a conventional type war, would be a situation where there was a false warning or command and control was interfered with. We're in a cyber world now. That makes the whole nuclear equation much more difficult because it's not just the nuclear giants can can play this game in terms of hacking into warning systems, giving false warning, causing some kind of mistaken notification of an attack, and basically causing a catastrophic blunder. And when weapons go on alert, as Mr. Putin at least ordered his military to do, uh, that makes all these things more difficult. So those are the concerns I have. Right now, one of the things we're really uh, pushing and I'm hoping the Biden administration is going to really move in this direction is a fail-safe review. It would be a U.S. review of our own system, making sure we do everything to prevent any kind of blunder, any kind of mistaken warning, making sure we are as protected from cyber interference as we can possibly be. Uh, This would not be a treaty. It would not take negotiation. It would not take congressional approval, although they already support it. They've got a provision like this in their authorization bill, military authorization bill, and it could make a big difference in terms of our own posture, making sure we take mistakes as far as possible off the table. And also, if I were President Biden, I would urge the other countries in the world, including Russia and China, to do the same thing internally. I think out of that will not only reduce chances of an accident, but I think we'd also find areas where we absolutely need to work together and drawing red lines on cyber, not interfering in command and control and warning systems is one of the areas where we have, uh, I think, a very strong mutual interest. Yeah, Sam, you've raised a very acute issue, which is part of a, you know, sort of a bigger issue which is technology is a very, very powerful force for good. But there's a risk that sometimes 
you know, we see technological advances outrunning our, our, our ability to manage it or to control it, right? And, and so th there's so much that needs to be redone in, in terms of global governance, in, in, in terms of just the way the world has changed today. Been a lot of focus on climate change, but I'd like to get back to another one where you're a, a real expert and been ahead of the game. NTI also focuses on biological threats, an issue that the COVID-19 catastrophe has made all too real. What can the world do to prepare for, prevent, and respond to future biological risks? Well, we, we at NTI have done a, a series of nuclear indexes where we measure uh, countries all over the world with an economist intelligence unit in terms of their ability to manage and safeguard nuclear materials. Out of that idea comes the idea that we came up with in 2020, uh, and that is a biological index to look at the country's capacity all over the world to deal with a pandemic. Uh, we started it before the pandemic. In fact, we issued the first report before the pandemic. And the United States, uh, all countries, no country was adequately prepared. That was the headlines. Every country had a lot of work to do to get ready for that kind of threat. And lo and behold, we had that kind of threat not long after we issued our report. And so preparedness, early warning, early detection, cooperation, emergency capability uh, in medical terms and in vaccines, all of those things are enormously important. But we also found out in this COVID tragedy that political will and po political cohesion are uh, right near the top of the list. Uh, it's absolutely essential that the public have confidence in the public health officials, and it's absolutely essential that they have confidence in political leadership. We were woefully short on that kind of cohesion and cooperation in the United States. So we got a long way to go. The whole world's got a long way to go. The United States is in better position than almost all countries in the world in this regard, but only if we work together and only if we have trust in those who are really the scientific experts in this regard. We've done a ter terrific job on vaccines. Credit the Trump administration, credit the Biden administration for following through. We haven't done nearly as well on testing. Even in the last six or eight months, we didn't have enough testing capacity. And that is one of the essentials you've got to have. So there are all sorts of things we're gonna have to do uh, to deal with the biological threat. And Hank, the biological threat, as I view it, is mother nature but it's also possibly deliberate. When any bad guy sees what's going on in the world and the tremendous devastation caused by COVID, then they've got to be scratching their head and say, hey, can we do this? And that means that we're going to have to have tremendous amount of cooperation in dealing with the dark side of the bio developments. And bio has all sorts of potential for the good, but it's also got a, a serious dark side and we're going to have to cooperate and have cooperation with laboratories. We're going to have to have uh, rules, I think, uh, and cooperation in terms of uh, sequencing DNA, where there's tremendous upside and downside. There are all sorts of things that we're going to have to work together on. So I've said in the nuclear arena for a long time that we're in a race between cooperation and catastrophe. I think that applies just as strongly in the biological era. When you look back on your very extraordinary career, what do you think are your defining accomplishments? Well, what are you most proud of? Well, you may find this strange, but I go back to Perry, Georgia, and I helped form a biracial committee in 1964. I was president of Perry Chamber of Commerce, and I helped working with the mayor of the city get a recreation area in a black neighborhood that had no place for the young people to go. So put that on the list of way before I got into politics. And then, of course, um, when I got into the political world, I think probably in the military is where I would be recognized more for, for leadership. One would be the Goldwater-Nichols legislation, which Barry and I and Bill Nichols and many others worked together on, which basically um, was a huge step forward in getting Army, Navy, Air Force, Marine Corps, Coast Guard to cooperate and be able to fight together. That made a, a lot of difference. It continues to jointness, a lot of other features of that, but I won't go into details. Dick Lugo was my trusted partner on the, what became known as the Non-Lugo Bill, which helped the uh, former Soviet Union republics deal safely with their nuclear 
chemical and biological weapons and materials after the Cold War. At one point, we were buying nuclear materials that came out of the missiles and warheads that had been aimed at us. And basically, 10% of our electricity was coming from highly enriched uranium that had been in those warheads, blended down to low enriched uranium. And for about 10 years, about 10% of our electricity. So this was truly turning swords into, into plowshares. That was a cooperative program. And with Russia at that time, and with Ukraine and Kazakhstan and Belarus. So that program was a very important and something dear to your heart, Hank. And I was one of several folks, but I worked very hard in the Senate to pass the uh, Conservation Reserve Program, which basically was aimed at cleaning up our streams, preventing erosion, protecting the soil, protecting the water. Uh, it has made a huge difference over time where our government came in and helped uh, farmers and landowners that were stewards in protecting the preventing the erosion and that is still ongoing has made a lot of difference so those are those are some of the highlights that i think were important and i played at least uh, anywhere from a small to a medium to a large role in those depending on the legislation you sure did and you served at a time when people worked across party lines you know, working with people like Dick Luger and others, and it, it made a big, big difference. Now, Sam, to wrap things up here, what advice do you have for our younger listeners who are starting out their careers in today's very complex and rapidly changing world filled with opportunities, but looks pretty, uh, pretty dangerous also? What advice do you give young folks today starting their career? Well, that's, that's a great question for all of us who have been in leadership because setting an example is, is enormous, enormously important in any, any profession where there's high visibility, and that includes certainly not limited to politics. I would say read, 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 read history, read history, read history. I would say respect others, listen to others, learn to be a good listener, and you learn from listening. But respect is enormously important individual to individual as well as nation to nation. The other items I would list is I had a lot of heroes growing up and sometimes history destroys heroes because we find out more about them. But I would say that it's important to have examples that uh, inspire young people. So choose your heroes carefully, but have heroes, read about them in history. And as you get a little older, beyond having a careful choice of heroes, choose your spouse very carefully, because Hank, you're blessed with one of the uh, out, outstanding women I've known in Wendy. She does everything and does it well. Tremendous conservationist, teacher, and so forth. I've been very fortunate with my spouse, Colleen, because she's a, she's a um, tremendous asset. Has uh, uh, certainly everything I've done, uh, she has played a huge role in, from politics to the corporate world, whatever. So choose your spouses very carefully. And I'd say also one other thing is communication skill. No matter what profession you're in, science is probably now more important. Learn to communicate in ways that people can understand because we've got to communicate with each other. We've got to have young people seek out diversity of friends so that we begin to listen to people that we don't always agree with. This country split now. You mentioned getting our house in order at home. I think that's got to be at the very top of our list. I think you're right on that. And one of the ways we've got to do that is for all citizens to really listen to others and don't just get in your neighborhood and your circle and let the world close in on you with communication. You've got to broaden your horizons, listen to people, disagree with them. That's part of democracy, where you but do it in a civil way. Civility and respect, enormously important. Listening and very important. Heroes, very important. And back to the spouses, nothing can be more important than the trusted partners you have in life. Very, very well said. Learn, listen, communicate. So many of the opportunities to solve problems are only going to be realized if we can work with others. And the problems that we have in almost every rock of life are people problems. Now, I thank you a lot. This has been terrific. You've given us a lot to think about. And uh, I thank you for all you've done and are doing to make the world a safer place. 
You have listened to Straight Talk with Hank Paulson, a podcast of the Paulson Institute. To find more episodes from leading thinkers and doers, please visit paulsoninstitute.org backslash straight talk or download on Apple, Google Play, Spotify, and Stitcher. And don't forget to rate and subscribe. Thank you for listening and see you next time.